It's a triple pleasure, really, for me to uh, uh, be helping out with this afternoon's session, uh, partly because this very building was where I started my journalistic career in England, working for the BBC External Services, partly because I'm uh, editorial advisor uh, to reaction and partly because I'm a fellow of King's College having been on the council for nine years so uh, however it is not about me as you all know uh, we are here uh, to discuss uh, uh, the economic warfare and the implications uh, for investment for the private sector coming from that in the uh, next stage of our uh, Defence of Europe panel I should say uh, we're going to talk for about half an hour then we will be taking questions for the panel uh, from the audience. Uh, when that happens, there'll be people with microphones. Please wait for the microphone. Otherwise, those people watching online or afterwards uh, won't know what you're saying. But without further ado, let's uh, welcome our panel. So we have Pauline Neville-Jones, uh, who is a former chair of the Joint Intelligence Committee, also, of course, a former security minister. Uh, and uh, next to her, Dr. Martin uh, Nabias, who's a banking and uh, finance lawyer and a senior visiting research fellow here at KCL. Uh, then Marion uh, Somerset Webb, uh, contributing editor to the Financial Times. You'll certainly have seen her output if you're rich enough to read the money section of the FT on Saturdays. Uh, and finally, uh, we're joined by uh, Jacob Gear, who is uh, head of surveillance and tracking at the United Kingdom Space Agency. Uh, welcome to you all. Uh, Pauline, uh, obviously we know about warfare in terms of fighting, but it seems to me, and I'm I hope you agree that there are many, many other components uh, of modern warfare, as we've seen in Ukraine, particularly the whole question of economic muscle. And indeed, used in the form of sanctions. <coughs> um, it's, worth, it's worth, I suppose, outlining, just, <coughs> excuse me, briefly. Um, excuse me. I think you can say that <coughs> there are basically three categories of sanctions that I can think of. There's a primary sanction, there is a secondary sanction, when the, the, sanction, the operation of the primary sanctions is monitored and reinforced, um, possibly by secondary sanctions of a kind which put extra pressure on those who are not conforming and not joining the sanctions. And <coughs> the third is counter sanctions, which we've just seen the Russians impose via <coughs> the way in which they've asked for oil and gas to be paid for, uh, and also um, <coughs> the way in which they have done something which I think is to their long-term disadvantage, which is to deny um, the Polish and the Bulgarian markets. <coughs> now, that says us something about Russian behavior, which they never did in the Cold War. They always fulfilled their contracts, and now they've broken a contract which I think tells you that this is now a political weapon as far as the Russians are concerned, which is bound to have effects on how the West responds. Um, it, in, it increases the pressure you know, to move away from supply by Russia. The other thing I think is worth saying just about sanctions is if you have UN support and you have a UN resolution, you're likely to get obviously a good deal more buy-in from the rest of the world. Um, most of the, I think increasingly that's hard to get. In the case of Russia, uh, we clearly won't get it because you've got a member of the Security Council capable of blocking any resolution. So clearly adherence to a sanctions regime is going to be voluntary on the part of other, other states in the world. Um, and as we've seen, not everybody is in agreement. So uh, as far as the sanctions on Russia are concerned, it will be a partial. It will be a, a partial feast. However, as the Western democracies, and particularly European countries, are a major purchaser of oil and gas, it will have an effect. Uh, what kind of effect is a different issue. I mean, the object often of sanctions you know, is to undermine the economy of the country concerned in order to change the policy via popular pressure on the leadership. The difficulty with this thesis uh, which is, I think, true probably of all, pretty much all sanctions, is that the countries that are the object of sanctions are usually run by people who don't actually have much uh, care for or track with the welfare of their populace. Uh, therefore, their li the likelihood of being impressed by popular discontent and opposition is rather low. 
the Ayatollahs, you can, you can num name, name a number. Um, I don't, however, think that for re that reason sanctions are ineffective. They don't always have the effect you want, and they can be absolutely counterproductive, as we are finding um, you know, with the shock, and I, I think use the word shock, that's been delivered to European economies uh, in terms of uh, the cost of energy. So th you have to think it through before you go down the sanctions regime. Martin, uh, just how <coughs> unprecedented are the sanctions we're seeing on both sides? I mean, what, what are we seeing? Because we're seeing government sanctions, but we're also seeing businesses making. Yeah, we, we, people to people. That's the other one I forgot. You know, state on people, Magnitsky, etc. Say sorry. Mm -hmm. um, well, we're seeing a full spectrum kind of sanctions uh, targeting um, Russia. I, I work on I work on application of sanctions on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't. I don't. Uh, my, my, my view is from the ground. It's not standing back and looking at overall. And so I, my perspective comes from the application. Now, even before this war, uh, in this country, uh, sanctions have become a, a very significant part of uh, UK foreign policy. The last time I looked at the Office of Financial Sanctions Implementation website, there were over 30 regimes, I think about 34 different sanction regimes that we have to navigate around on a day-to-day -day basis to, and to which we have to apply EU sanctions, which will diverge ultimately from the UK sanctions, US and US secondary sanctions. And it's, there are thousands of people across the city of London and, and, and the, on the continent trying to apply this, and it's costing billions of pounds. Um, and then the war came, and we saw a whole straw of new sets of sanctions being applied, trade sanctions, financial sanctions, immigration sanctions. I mean, in this country alone, over 1,000 people, new people have been designated, sanctioned, over 80 to 100 oligarchs, over 100 um, over a hundred, over a hundred entities. So the question is, how effective have they have those been? Well, in the short term, I think they're irrelevant to the battlefield. In the middle term, in my view, they will strengthen Putin. In the long run, well, that's a different story. In the long run, the question is, do we want to have sanctions in the long run? Because there are a number of questions that I would want to ask policymakers who are developing these sanctions that we are asked to apply here. Firstly, what are the purpose of these sanctions, right? Are we trying to influence the battlefield? Are we trying to, I mean, I mean the, 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 the sanctions in respect of Ukraine are articulated in that kind of way to get Russia to desist from its, from its destabilizing actions in Ukraine? Are we, are we trying to actually affect the battlefield? I mean, are we punishing Putin? Are we punishing his friends? Are we, are we, trying, to, um, are we trying to punish the Russian people? Right? Are we, are we trying to affect regime change? And, and, and most importantly, from what I can see, what do the Russians have to do in order to get out from under the yoke of sanctions? Right? Look, the North Koreans know what they have to do, and the Iranians also know what they have to do. But what do, what do the Russians have to do? So that is the first point I would say. The second point I, I would say is that not only do we have to uh, have an articulation by the, by, by, the, by the government as to what the purpose of the sanctions are, but we also have a real, realistic expectation of what sanctions can do. Um, there's a literature on the effectiveness on sanctions. We've been applying sanctions on North Korea, Cuba, uh, Iran, and, and many other countries for decades. How's that going? Um, the, the second point I, I, I would point out, at this, there's been a lot of self-congratulation amongst policymakers and others in respect of sanctions on, on Russia. Um, uh, uh, for ex uh, uh, Joe Biden said uh, um, the ruble will turn to rubble. The ruble looks pretty strong to me at this moment. Now, I understand the reasons for that, and they may not be long term, but that is the fact. The second un inescapable point, and you see this working I don't like saying the front line because I don't like those military analogies, but, but on the ground, is that we are financing both sides of the war. We are actually financing both sides of the war. Um, and other reasons are explicable, right? We, we know that we cannot pull ourselves out of our gas consumption and our oil and coal and our other commodity consumption. But this is outrageous. I mean, it's immoral, isn't it? I mean, we're in the ironic position that as we seek to curtail our imports of Russian commodities and oil and gas, we're pushing the price up. 
The Russians are earning more than they've ever earned as a result of oil and gas. So over the past two months, according to some figures, I mean, these figures are contested, obviously, the, the Russians have earned over 40, 44 billion dollars uh, from their exports to, to, to Europe, as opposed to 140 billion during 2021. They're almost 50 percent in terms of income of, of their projections for 2022. And there are other effects of, of sanctions too. Um, which, which you, you previously said, these things have to be thought through, and sometimes I don't think they are thought through. There's a problem of de-risking. I mean, effectively on the ground, I, you don't really expect financial institutions to sit around and look, is this individual subject to sanctions? Is that individual subject? It doesn't work like that, right? People will totally de-risk from, from, from anything Russian. So simple, so ordinary people will, will not do. And finally, my last point is that there are third world countries, there are other countries that do not have a dog in this fight, that are, are suffering the consequences of these rising in, in, in energy prices. So my answer to you is the sanctions at the moment, in the long term they will hold out some hope, but in the short and medium term, the consequences are there for our economies and our allies' economies are pr pretty, lo pretty significant. Well, thank you for that. I, you were talking about the impact on the private sector, on business there, and, and, and Marin, you know, these days, Companies, investors, they want to respect ESG, uh, economic and social and governance issues. They want to be seen to do the right thing. But how easy is it to really do the right thing in terms of wanting to have an impact of uh, put the pressure on Russia to stop the war? Yeah, well, this is really interesting. It's one of the things I've been writing about for a while, but the, the war has really thrown it in fairly sharp, rel sharp relief. You know, there's been a huge amount of money pouring into ESG strategies for investing since about 2015, based on the idea that if you invest in a way uh, uh, taking into account all these different factors, you will also do better. So over time, you'll out outperform every index under the sun if you just behave well at the same time. But the question is, A, how do you behave well? And B, is the, is the outperformance bit true? And we don't know about the outperformance bit, but we do know is that it's verging on impossible to identify good behavior when it comes to the corporate world. You know, we do an awful lot of box ticking, which makes the whole thing very, very rigid. Uh, but we also have a million different organizations creating the boxes, which makes it incredibly flexible at the same time, which, of course, makes it completely meaningless. And one of the things that I, that I wrote about a, a few weeks ago was about de the defense sector. Now, if you run an ESG fund of any kind over the last five, five years or so, you will have been absolutely determined to avoid the defense sector because it doesn't tick any boxes at all. It's not environmentally friendly. It doesn't appear to be socially friendly. It doesn't perhaps encourage good governance. So if you look at any defense company, you would go, well, that's not ESG. So what do you do? You exclude it. And in excluding it, uh, you make it unpopular. You get to the point of beginning to starve it of capital. Uh, you move defense companies into the private sector, et cetera. And all these are, they are not good things. They are, they are bad things. And along the way, you take an industry that, in fact, we now look at and say, well, in fact, this is, this is an S and this is a G. Because without defense companies, how can we uh, preserve living standards? How can we preserve life, even? So suddenly, defense is an S. It may be a G. Gosh, it may even be an E if you fiddle around with the numbers enough. So the concept of what is ESG and what is not is, is shifting all the time. And the other big part of that, which reflects partly what you were saying, is the fossil fuel industry, which has been treated as an absolute pariah by ESG for the last decade plus. Again, constantly being excluded uh, from ESG portfolios, being treated as though it is in itself a genuinely evil thing. And we see that extending into governments as well. And as we starve our big old companies of capital, and as we push our, our they're not that short of it right now. Huh? They're not that short of it right not now. Not right now, but they have been in the past, and you know that's in a part where why we are where we are at the moment. We have discouraged fossil fuel production in the West, uh, in countries which we might consider to be friendly, including our own, for that matter, and that has left us overly dependent on external sources. So you might say what we've what we've done is effectively kind of advanced self-sanctioned ourselves with our ESG strategies. And that needs a very big conversation in the investment industry right now. Now, what about the final frontier then, space? How, how is the war impacting on space, both in terms of government and increasing private sector investment? Uh, well, firstly, let me say uh, hello and thank you for the invitation. Uh, I represent the UK Space Agency. We're an agency part of uh, government. Uh, we look after civil matters. So defense and war isn't my normal subject matter. Uh, and there's people here that know more about it than I do. Um, to answer your question, um, space is inherently a dual-use sector, a dual-use environment. 
everything in space can be used for civilian purposes or indeed for military. And so I think we've seen the, the recent conflict in Ukraine prove to people just how dependent they are upon space assets or what a difference uh, satellites in the right place at the right time can make to your war effort. Um, a couple of examples, if I may. Um, the, the Russians have been uh, denying or jamming GPS all around the Donbass region and down to the south as well. So they've been using local assets to jam the signals coming down from space, degrading Ukrainian uh, armaments targeting communications. Uh, on the, uh, the, uh, the, the side of the Ukrainians, um, Earth observation data, pictures taken from satellites of the ground. So there's a famous picture of the Russian convoy inching towards and then away from Kiev, all taken by commercial satellite companies that just provided their data for free to Ukraine and the world. Just there you go. You've got an I-Star capability for free on, on day two of the war. Fantastic. Um, the OneWeb satellites, are a, a British partly British government-owned company, had 36 satellites and a launch pad in Baikonur in Kazakhstan. The Russians said, thank you very much, we'll take all of those, and are now busy looking at the various different hardware and software that's gone into them as well. Um, that's an effect of, of war on, on our industry as well. So we've seen recently a, a recognition of, of space as an important domain. Um, we've seen NATO recognising space as a warfighting domain. We've seen the UK Space Command stood up joining the, the French, US, now the Australian Space Command, Japan. The military's uh, getting more interested in this, in this domain. On the civilian side, I think we're starting to see a lot more uh, procurement outside of the US. The US was always a procurement-led space sector. The government was underpinning that area. I think now in the UK and other areas, we're starting to see lots more chunky government contracts for space capabilities coming out. And we started that conversation about sovereignty, about independence, about requiring national protection of the supply chain, for example, because people are recognising how important space is. And that is starting to be felt across the space sector here in the UK. Marion, how does space do on the ESG? <laughs> I don't think it gets many ratings yet, but I suspect that, um, uh, well, as I say, ESG is everything and nothing. There'll be some people who'll be able to find lots of boxes to take for everything in space to be a good thing, and some people will find lots of them to take for it to be a bad thing. I mean, it's interesting. The, flexibility the of world's it. two richest men are, are going into space, aren't they? And they are. And again, I mean, Twitter is an absolute classic of the ESG conversation, right? So, I mean, I, again, I wrote another column a little while ago, uh, well, last week, maybe the week before, when we were talking about Elon Musk taking over Twitter. And I looked at its ESG ratings, and it has very high ratings. Um, but would you necessarily give it a high rating? rating under, under S, you know, so once you start looking at it properly, and uh, will you give it a higher, rating under, a higher rating on S once it's owned by Elon Musk than you've given it one, when it's owned by the market? How much do we value free speech? Is free speech an S? Is it a G? We'll find out. If I can come in there, the, the, the same satellites I mentioned that flying over Ukraine, giving free imagery to the Ukrainians, about six hours later, they're flying over the Amazon, looking for deforestation, for, for new uh, changes in the rainforest there. That's pretty much their environmental raise and debt to before this conflict. And now they find a new market to buy or supply their services to. Uh, Pauline Neville Jones, as the almost politician here, <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you say to Martin's view that sanctions basically uh, are pretty flawed? Well, uh, first of all, uh, the question you do have to ask is, well, what's the alternative? I mean, you said, rightly, that we're financing both sides of the war. If we didn't have any sanctions, we'd be financing the other side of the war even more. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not ideal. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not perfect. But uh, I think you have to argue that, and have to accept that it's a, a contribution to, uh, to policy. I think sanctions are always overwritten you know, as to what they can achieve. They don't, on the whole, bring down regimes. Uh, but they can do them quite a lot of damage. I would say that this war, combined with the economic penalties that it's imposing on the existing globalized system, is going to have long-term consequences. Because I say, I don't think we're going to go back you know, to a status quo ante uh, with the Russians. So I think we have, this is, this is permanent change in the game, I think. And one, I, I think it's, a, uh, unless I'm quite wrong about you know, how quickly this war ends, uh, we are going to find, I think, that we, we revert to something that Ben Wallace used the term twice in the previous session, containment. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we're going to see quite a lot of old, old policies uh, resurrected. 
Martin, well, I mean, you, you said that you thought in the medium term this would actually strengthen Putin the regime. Why? Because of the money? Well, because he controls the media within Russia. He controls the narrative. We don't have access to the Russian people directly. And he can explain yeah. the hardships that are occurring uh, to the Russian people by our actions. And one of, the, one of the things that's missing in our policy is any kind of counter-information. You know, I'm old enough to go back to the Cold War when we had in the Foreign Office something called Information Research Department, which was a polite title for actually interfering in other people's politics. Uh, and we did it very actively and rather successfully. And the Russians do it to us, but what have we done so far? Well, it should be said, I think the BBC World Service has no, upped, I mean, you, upped you, you its much input into Russia. That. The Russians are doing it all the time to us with, with their cyber operations. Um, uh, now, but I'm, but I'm, I'm not suggesting we emulate all of the tactics they use, but we do need to try to penetrate what you've just tried, correctly identified as being Putin's monopoly at home. The other thing I would say is that, though it's, it does take time, I think that globalized trade, you know, it isn't now a question of sending out finished products or stopping finished product. It's very much more a supply chain. And I think it is going to be the case that he's going to find that there are things in, missing in the supply chain which is going to hamper not only the, the economy, but actually his military capability as well. There's more inside you know, Russian, Russian armament of Western origin than people realize. So uh, this is not without, I think, you know, real impact actually on fighting capability. Um, I can, can, I can <laughs> agree, agree with uh, what, what you say. Yeah. I, I, you, you raise yeah. the issue uh, what is the option, right? And there, there isn't an option. I agree absolutely that we should be sanctioning the Russians for their aggression. What I would oppose, um, and we haven't come to that yet, is secondary sanctions. What I understand, what I mean by secondary sanctions is the, what the US does it in relation to Iran and Cuba, is that we sanction right. other countries that are, are, are dealing with the Russians. Um, I would feel uncomfortable about that because those, many of those countries would be countries that have little choice. Because, I mean, we're already feeling that the consequences. Well, India would be an obvious in, example. In, in India, Sri Lanka, Peru. Uh, there are a whole raft of countries that are, 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 are feeling the consequences. Now, in the short term, as I said, and I think we agree, uh, the, uh, the, the impact on the war will be m minimal, right? Putin doesn't need doesn't need us to do anything for him to prosecute the war in the short term. Um, in the middle term, in the midterm, as I said, I, I will strengthen him. In the long term, yeah, because uh, uh, his weapon system, his economy is dependent. In the long term, we will force down his, his GDP, we'll reduce his, the consumption in Russia, we'll reduce investment, and we will create a lot of problems. Well, what we've got to ask ourselves, and that's another question which, which the government has got to, got to provide us, is, as I, as I asked, what do the Russians have to do to get out of it? And how does, how does this relate well, to on, our end game? I mean, you, you've asked that question, but isn't the answer stop the war? I mean, not, not, not invade Ukraine. I mean, that's fairly simple, okay, isn't well, it? Well, let, 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 that will be settled on, 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 on the battlefield. What I'm, what I'm asking is, do we want to be in a position, and we've been down this route before, where we continue to sanction a regime that feels defeated, uh, uh, lost, resentful. I mean, we've done this before and it didn't end very well, okay? We don't want to make the pip squeak. So what I'm well, saying well, is... Well, I mean, hypothetical. I mean, reparations is, is an interesting question when you see the destruction that's Reparations been, uh, is a good, good, uh, good uh, talking point, but practically, I don't see it happening. Um, I mean, we can't seriously believe, right? I mean, the Russians are facing some form of defeat, right? Whether it's uh, spinnable or catastrophic. But I cannot imagine a, a circumstance where we will, we will occupy Moscow and force them to pay reparations like we did to the, the Germans in, in 1918. That, that, that's, that's dream time. I mean, Mary, what, what, one of the obvious persons of sanctions is, is kind of disinvestment, isn't it? To get companies out and companies aren't pulling out. So in that sense, they are. they're working, aren't they? 
Uh, for companies, yes. So it, if, if what you want from the listed companies around the world is for them to divest themselves of all their operations in Russia immediately, then yes, you're getting that. An awful lot are. In fact, the majority have. And you're also having what you just said about non, you know, lack of discrimination when it comes to uh, dealing with, for example, Russian people in the city, etc. Instead of looking at who's a sanctioned and who isn't, you're getting a sort of mass pullback of, of all business with people with Russian connections, etc. So you are seeing that happen, absolutely. But it's a bit late in the day, I think, is the thing to say there, you know, and that there is this G in ESG, and all of the fund managers, investment managers who over the last four or five years have been heavily invested in Russian companies should now be looking at themselves and saying, well, was I actually paying any attention to the G, or for that matter, to the S? So, for example, take the big uh, Russian oil and gas companies. Now, if you looked at the ESG ratings on those, even through March this year, quite a few of those big companies had better ESG ratings than, for example, companies operating in the North Sea supplying gas to the UK and better ESG ratings than a lot of the companies that you and I would think of as being perfectly reasonable and providing perfectly adequate goods and services to consumers here. So uh, that just shows you that the wrong boxes are being ticked, because if you had looked at those companies and thought, well, hang on a tick, you know, the natural resources curse is something we've all known about for a long time, and we all know, we should know if we studied any economic history, that if you support companies in resource-rich countries, the taxes of which go to support non-democratic governments, you tend to end up with some kind of crisis or another. And this, of course, is one that affects us all. So were you uh, sitting around a couple of years ago looking at your ESG portfolio and looking at what you had ticked and what you had not and had any foresight around the G, possibly you would have invested differently. So there's a big wake-up call here for the industry when it comes to G. Jacob, we think, I certainly think of a lot of space as international cooperation. We had the International Space Centre and all the rest of it. But are we entering a new era of national competition to a certain extent? Uh, I think it does appear that we are a little bit. Mm. The cooperation in space, so the, the International Space Station, which was always a Russian, U US <coughs> and other nations coalescing around that, that seems to be now being something the Russians want to pull out from and stop doing. The, the Russian support to, to exploration missions, going to the moon, going to Mars, things that have no military consequence at all seems to be lessening now. They, they've stopped launching our our uh, science payloads. Uh, there's a particular rover that's been built in Stevenage called the Roslyn Franklin rover. Needs a, a Russian system to get down to the surface of Mars. We're now going to have to go back, spend about four or five years and quite a lot of money finding a new system somewhere else in the world to do the same job. So there are impacts of this and it, and it is becoming quite apparent that the Russians see their, their space capabilities as something they can trade and take away or put back to, to suit their political ambitions. And, and one final point. It's yet to, we're yet to see how China are going to mirror this or, or otherwise. Do they see this as a, a playbook they can look to do the same thing with? Uh, there's been no change in their cooperation with international partnership at the moment, but they have started talking about Russian-Chinese space stations, about Russian-Chinese moon bases. So again, we're, those allies in the military sphere seem to be coming together into the, the space domain as well. And that will, as I said earlier, have military implications in the longer term. Right, we're going to take questions in just a moment, so if you could raise your hands. What we'll try and do is get the uh, people with the microphones to you in advance so we don't have sort of awkward pauses. Uh, so uh, <coughs> any, anyone who's got a question already, uh, one there at the back. Um, we'll bring you in in a moment. Uh, anyone else, second question? No, OK, well, we'll have those in a moment. But I, I, I want to, before we go to the floor, I want to ask you about something about we haven't talked about so far. Magnitsky sanctions, in other words, personalised sanctions, a lot of media focus on oligarchs, and of course we've had the Albert Brownvich Chelsea situation, all the rest of it. Are those a good idea? Um, well, there's been, there's been, I think, uh, a feeling that uh, the whole um, sort of Russian investment personal oligarchic in London, dirty money, needs clearing up. And that's been around for a very long time. Uh, and, and rightly, I mean, we do not want to become a washing machine for dirty money. Uh, and the city is probably uh, has been involved been, in that. And, uh, and our legal profession, a lot of other things. So uh, not, and I think not particularly savoury. Um, does the, the present uh, sanctioning of given individuals make much difference in real life? No, it makes it difficult for them to travel. Mr. Putin now clearly can't leave Russia, and a whole lot of other people can't leave Russia safely. I mean, they will you know, be subject to international arrest. 
Um, so, I mean, it, 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 has, it has effects on personal freedoms, but um, I'm, a, to be frank, a bit sceptical about it. So am I. <clears throat> what do you think, Mary? <laughs> Oh, well, one of the problems with it, as you said earlier, is that uh, you know Russian money is shot through our entire system in one way or another. There are lots of uh, well-off Russians living in London. They're very fully invested in our financial system. And if you have uh, sanctions on individuals, no one knows who's going to be sanctioned next or who is connected to who. So you do end up bunging up a lot of stuff. I mean, that may be OK, uh, but there are a lot of unintended consequences in the financial world from sanctioning a few uh, prominent people. I should add, I think then there not as complicating a factor. I mean, it, it, it enables us to express disapproval, and people like me able to do that. Um, but it's not as complicating a factor as the allegations about uh, you know, war crimes and uh, all the other charges of, of a nature, which will now make it uh, quite difficult to know whether you can actually deal with any of these people. Um, and you have to find new interlocutors who haven't actually been no, given these labels, in order to have a negotiation. Well, so that's, that's also quite tricky. Yeah, I mean, the oligarchs have got a, a lot of bad press, and, and rightfully so. But sometimes the reporting has gone slightly mm -hmm. over, over the line. You know, the oligarchs have infiltrated our, our, our society, and their money is everywhere. Within two seconds, the government rolled them up overnight. And the, Oh, no oh, oligarchs man. have ever had Not any... Not all of them. I'm, I'll come to that one, the one <laughs> I'm thinking about. If these people had infiltrated our society, as, as, as was claimed, they, they were as effective as the Russian Air Force in the first two weeks of the war, which means they weren't very effective. Indeed, there, there, was, there was one case that I, that I looked at um, of, of, a, of a Russian oligarch that owned some newspapers and was in the House of, of, of Laws, uh, and, and his dad was, was a former KGB agent. And I thought, gee whiz, that, that looks pretty awkward. But he's still there. And we're still doing what, what, what we're doing. So, I, I mean, it's a, we have a problem in this country of, 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 of where we cannot determine the provenance of funding that's coming into it. Our, our competitors, and I'm not talking about Moscow, I'm talking about Paris, Amsterdam, and Frankfurt, they have the same problem. Ours is bigger because our economy is bigger. But, but ultimately, this is a criminal problem that, that, that can be managed and, and is being managed to the best of, of everybody's capability. Right, let's go to the floor. Uh, gentleman there, and then we'll come there next. Uh, has he got a microphone? Yep. Hi, go my name's Arian. Yeah, carry on. Um, I have a question about talking about secondary sanctions. So with reference to India in particular, buying discounted Russian energy products, where, which are kind of undermining the sanctions. But on the other hand, how would you deal with a country like that? Because on one hand, it's causing problems when trying to counter Russia. But on the other hand, long-term thinking with China, you wouldn't want to alienate India, because of course you have to think with the Pacific region, India will be a very important country to deal with. They want to feel that India. Well, um, if I heard the <clears throat> question correctly, I mean, it seems to me that it would be a mistake for us to try to impose secondary sanctions on India. If you really want to get support, what you need to be able to do clearly is to offer them an alternative. That, in the short term, that may be difficult in the energy market. But I certainly do think that one needs to continue to talk to countries like India. Um, you know, a, 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 an exchange of views and actually explaining e each other's difficulties you know, is not, not, not a silly thing to be doing. Um, <clears throat> similarly, one wants, obviously, to persuade people that uh, aligning themselves with China in this is not a brilliant idea. And the Chinese themselves have been, as far as I can see, quite careful. They haven't, in fact, endorsed. They haven't, in fact, endorsed the, the uh, takeover of of, uh, of Crimea. Um, I think they regard their Taiwan issue as being the law on their side. We might disagree with that, but therefore, I think legalism is actually quite important in this game. Uh, so I don't actually see them as coming in you know, right behind the Russians. I think they won't discard them, but I think they'll be quite careful. Uh, so it, there may not be this sort of great coalescing of two autocratic uh, countries. And we need to prevent that happening. And that is going to require very skillful diplomacy. And it's diplomacy we keep on coming back to sure. in this that needs to accompany the military and the economic. Yeah, I agree with that and, and, and what was said about uh, secondary sanctions. I, uh, we, we, there are many, many countries out there, India is, is a primary one, that do not see the war 
the way we see the war. And even if they did see the war the way we see the war, do not have the economic capability to divest themselves from, from, uh, from, from their, their, their Russian connections. So there's no obligation, UN obligation to do so? Uh, uh, absolutely. And, and just lastly, if I can just push back on something you said, Adam. You said well, the easiest way to end sanctions is for the war to end, right? But it's not exactly like that, because what happens if the Russians determine tomorrow we'll just stop? Right? We'll stop. We'll, we'll sit in place. Mm. Does that mean? And right? And and uh, and there they are. Does that mean that sanctions? Well, then I wouldn't define that as the end of the war. I mean. Yeah. Oh well. I, I, okay. I, so I, it's, it's your definition of what the right. end of the war looks. Like. <laughs> All right. But uh, it, it is a great risk, Adam. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I, I just want to ask you about this. I don't know what you call. It. I mean, one of the things about the city, which has grown the financial sector, is basically they take anybody's money. Um, yeah. And now there's a kind of element of. Uh, Nationalism, if not if not racism, perhaps in some cases, coming into it, and, and presumably, that will mean a much smaller city in the long run, won't it? Well, not necessarily. I mean, it depends on how you look at our competition. If everyone behaves in the same way, then the city doesn't necessarily get smaller. And I don't see why you can't be um, an entirely open financial centre while still having in place uh, filters to present, uh, prevent dirty money coming in. And that's something we haven't been particularly good at, is the filtering. Um, but we can get better at that without being quite as indiscriminate as we're being at the moment. But, but I mean, a rough guess, how much of the percentage of the money going through the city is dirty money? I can't make that guess. I'm simply not privy to that information. <laughs> I mean, are we talking tenth, half? No, I mean, you know, this is the, the city is a hugely successful place, and the majority of the money inside it is legitimate. It's one of the greatest service centres in the world. It's a, London, the city of London is a phenomenal place. Taking away the dirty money around the edges is going to be marginal. Okay, uh, next question, the gentleman there. Hi, yeah, um, it's the principal job of all governments to protect their citizenry. What can defence and aerospace firms do to uh, reach out to investors, retail or institutional, um, to let them know that investment in those industries is important? Secondly, um, the amount of foreign investment in Russia is dwarfed by foreign investment in China. Uh, is the panel's feeling towards that positive? Um, what could potentially happen with the situation in t uh, China? If you could speak to that, that'd be great. Well, do you want me to say that first one? Yeah. Investment. Well, the first thing to say is that um, uh, they can stop telling them that it's bad, right? So we've spent the last five years listening to the investment industry, encouraged by every lobby group under the sun. And this is fair. It makes sense, right? So after the great financial crisis, the financial industry was deemed the most evil thing in the world. So they need to find a way to claw back from, from that depth of misery and show everyone that they're really, really good people trying to do really, really good things. And ESG is, is, is partly an effect of that fantastic marketing campaign that they've been doing. But in doing so, they have simply announced ESG, this is good. If we follow these rules, this is a good thing. What they haven't done is stop to explain to the end investor, to the retail investor, the beneficial investor, the actual owner of all assets, what that means. If we do this, the consequences are. If we do this, the consequences are. I'm not entirely sure, to be fair, they thought this through themselves, but now they're getting a good lesson in what the consequences are of the way in which they have invested and the way in which they have marketed over the last five years. So what we need to see now is a reversal. And we are getting that already. You're already seeing a lot of the big fund managers, as I said earlier, saying, well, yeah, defense you know, maybe that's okay. And uh, fossil, fossil fuels actually kind of turns out we need them. And oh, do you know what? The coal we need to make this deal to make the wind turbines, maybe that's not so bad after all. Um, so we're seeing that reversal already. It's beginning to become more nuanced. So we need to see a, a much more nuanced marketing approach from the city, a much more nuanced approach to what is good and what is bad. And also, I'm, one of the things I talk about a, a lot in my work is a kind of radical transparency from the fund management industry to their end clients. This is what we're doing. This is what the companies we're investing in do. These are the consequences of how we and they invest and what they do. And how do you feel about it? So, you know, there is, there's been a huge information gap between the industry and the beneficial owners of the assets that industry manages. And I hope that if there is any silver lining at all to drag out here, one of them may be uh, a change in that dynamic. And Martin, if we're moving towards, as, as Pauline says, a containment era, does that mean pulling back in China as well? Well, you know, the, 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 the precedent has been set now. Um, the way we have treated Russian individuals and Russian money in this country is a, is a, is a, can be used against Chinese money as well. Um, and other, other um, individuals that we do not um, uh, take too much to, 
at the moment. I, I mean, I, I, if I can just say one thing about 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 um, about the oligarchs um, and 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 the city, um, member of parliament got up and named and shamed lawyers who were defending oligarchs um, uh, for reasons that you, you've set out because. Uh, they were representing the, uh, the oligarchs and, and, and apparently defending uh, uh, their money. I, I think that is wrong, OK? The, the, the lawyers follow the law. If members of parliament do not like the law, then they must change the law, right? Um, and as Lord, Lord Panic QC said quite explicitly, oligarch, that is the way we, we work. We have due process in this country, and that's what differentiates ourselves from Putin's Russia. And mass murderers, like oligarchs, both of them have the right to legal, legal services. As, as you, and I agree with, with, with what you said, the city is a massive, um, a massive component of, 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 of the British economy. Um, I, I, I don't think that dirty money impugns the reputation of the totality of the city. It's a criminal problem. Uh, but the reputation of the city, its capabilities, its employment, uh, um, uh, you know, strengths is, is massive. And I don't think we should go around adopting some of the talking points of our competitors. Do we need more regulation? More regulation? Well, I, I want to say about, something about China in, in that yeah, respect. We, I mean, we just passed an act which is intended actually to make it uh, harder to make uh, investments or cooperate with China in areas which the government has defined as being technologically or industrially very important. Uh, and I think there's a large degree of uh, agreement about their definitions, not necessarily going to be so easy to implement. Uh, but nevertheless, what you can see, this has really nothing to do with what we're talking about, about Ukraine. It's a much longer term uh, tend tre trend towards onshoring. The Americans are doing it more vigorously than we are. But I think we're all going to do it. And, other, and even you know, countries like Germany, having <coughs> seeing their, their IP you know, stolen absolutely consistently by, by the Chinese now, are much less keen on investment in, in China. They'd rather do it at home and export. So there is a change in, in structures going on, uh, which I think what, what happens now in Russia, of course, is going to reinforce. Uh, I mean, all of these things, if you regard globalization as good news, which broadly has brought a lot of prosperity, though some inequalities, I would say, uh, th these are all, in a sense, backward moves, but I think they're, they're now, they're, they've got a, with the wind behind them, and I think we are going to see it happen. I mean, Jacob, in, in your area of, of, of space, do you see any difference between Russia and China in terms of attitudes towards cooperation, the rule of law, and all of that? Six months ago, the Russians were more cooperative than China were. And now, mm. obviously, that paradigm has shifted quite substantially. Um, it's interesting what you were just saying. We are, we are now seeing that the onshoring is the word you used. I mentioned sovereignty earlier or independence. We are seeing that push in the space sector as well. Export control being talked about much more openly and Absolutely. now just a, a fact of life for mm. companies. It used to be the US companies were hot on that and UK companies sort of shrugged. Now companies start to have their export control officers. They're getting used to that way of working as well. And actually, you can see it being a good thing for the UK economy. As long as we don't try and shift and, and cliff edge the capabilities or the supply chain we need, we gradually move them over and, and onshore them, as you say. Is there room in, in space for cooperation with China? Yes, very much so. There's, there's, it is fantastic, the, the academic collaboration we have with them at the moment on a number of areas. It's the actual missions, you, you give us that bit and we'll give you that part, that isn't quite working just yet. Over there. Uh, good afternoon. My name's Ray McSini. I'm head of ESG, a London-based asset manager, and previously I was in the British Army for almost 10 years. Um, I just wondered if the panel could comment on one particular sanction, uh, which I think has been perhaps particularly remarkable, both in the context of this particular uh, conflict, but also perhaps more broadly the impacts that we might see down the line, and that's the U.S. freezing of Russia's foreign effects uh, reserves. Yeah, I mean, I, I, sorry. Uh, no, go ahead. I mean, the, almost I think 300 billion of, of Russian reserves uh, were, were frozen, and like 100 billion of, of their gold. Yeah, I mean, this was part of Putin's war chest that he put in place to to get Russia. Through, through, through the sanctions, right? And I, I will agree that that was one aspect that he, that he did, not, did not expect. But I 
but I will, will say that the, that the, the, he has undertaken a number of other methods to shore up the ruble. I mean, Russian imports are decreasing anyway, right? So the balance of payments position in Russia is not as bad as, as, as we, what, what one would have thought would be the situation by now. But obviously, yeah, for sure, that, that has been a, a powerful move. However, it raises questions, and the last point I made, it raises questions about how much countries can, can trust an American dollar-denominated system. Because if the Americans and the, and the West can do this, um, well, maybe it's not the safest way. Maybe we should look at the Chinese system. Now, of course, the Chinese have their own, uh, their own, their own problems. I mean, at the moment, they don't even allow free uh, foreign exchange to go out, which is why the Russians couldn't put their money there in the, in the first place. But yeah, I would say that has been one of the more powerful uh, sanctions that have, have, have been put in place, unlike the oligarchs, which look good when we get hold of their, their, their boats and we chuck their girlfriends out of their houses in Kensington. Okay. Um, <laughs> The, 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 those kind of foreign exchange uh, um, uh, freezes are very important. I was going to say, I think a very important point has just been made. Um, I do think it has uh, results that potentially go wider than just Russia. Um, and one of the issues is going to be, how long could you keep that kind of freeze on? How long should you keep that kind of freeze on? But you know, other countries are going to look at this. I would put some money you know, on the Chinese reducing their dollar reserves mm. and seeking another thing which is you know, trying to get sure. international contracts written in renminbi, euros, reducing the impact which the Americans exploit to the full of the, of the dollar being the currency of international settlement. Sure. They are putting that at risk, I think. So you know, it's something which they really need to think about, and how far they take it. You agree? Uh, just agreeing, yep, nod, nod, entirely, absolutely. I mean, that's been something that's been talked about for a long time, but this might be one of the triggers to it actually happen. Mm -hmm. well, what direction would you think it will, will, will shift in? <sighs> what I currency? Just think dollar, what, dollar, dollar will what would be you, a What currency would you buy right now? <laughs> Ooh, uh, are you trying to get me onto cryptocurrencies? <laughs> <laughs> would you, where did you buy cryptocurrencies? No, I wouldn't. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. Um, what currency would I buy now? Right now, probably yeah. still the dollar. The dollar. Absolutely. Dollar this now. stuff doesn't happen quickly. Sure, yeah. Right now, definitely the dollar. That, and this is a, a gradual change. Do we end up with not one main currency being the, the settlement currency okay. across the world? Do we end up with yeah. a, you know, think about the way that the world has moved towards this, this period of global, globalization where we all do everything together, but we're moving towards a much more fractured world, and that may affect the currency markets as well. And where, where's the UK going to be? Is it going to be in the dollar zone or the euro zone? Ooh, dollar, zone. dollar zone, yeah. What, it, what, the, what this You're moving me into lots of guesswork here. <laughs> this, this reduces the impact of secondary sanctions because essentially secondary sanctions, as pursued by the US, are pursued through their ability to stop people's contracts right around the world. But the reason the Americans can be so aggressive is because they're reasonably confident. What are the alternatives? Yeah. I mean, what, 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 are you, what, what are you going to do? Well, people do your... find alternatives. But, but, but but for, yeah, but for large, large yeah. sums and, and, and for, for, for yeah. huge percentages yeah, of your economy. Also, as we're, if we're looking at uh, you know, friend shoring, onshoring, reshoring, whatever, whatever you like to call it, we get that currency fracturing mm. anyway. Sorry. OK, uh, let's get a question there, and then we'll come to the lady there. Uh, Tim Stickings, I'm a journalist at The National. Um, if the war settles down into a long battle in the East, uh, at what point do we think Western governments start losing interest or cracking on sanctions or, or stop being able to sell sanctions to the public as being sort of politically necessary because of the dire situation? I missed the beginning of the question. Well, if, if the, the war grinds on, grinds at on. what point do we get yeah. bored with sanctions? Uh, I think the question is, is a good one. Uh, how long can we keep up this level of enthusiastic unity? Uh, it will require a lot of effort, you know. I mean, and, and when we get into the autumn and it starts getting cold uh, and everybody has a domestic crisis as well, uh, it's, a, it's an excellent question. And the government's got to work hard at keeping people, you know, uh, in a sense, inspired by, by the good cause. I mean, Martin, does, does history tell us anything about how long you can sustain these sort of sanctions? Well, this is not my area. So our, our domestic politics, I, I know who as little as, no, as no, much I as anybody, for example, but I, I, I would have met, well, I would have, I, what I do know anecdotally is that most people, are, most people are influenced by domestic issues and economic issues, not by foreign policy 
issues. And the fact is, Ukraine is far away. Uh, what we know about that conflict is, uh, you know what I mean? Uh, it's well, not, little... not so far. And of course, if we have a danger of escalation, we may be in an entirely different political military situation. I mean, you know, this. this... The, the question was what happens if it grinds on? If it grinds on, but if it grinds on, it may well, as we heard this morning, and I think it's right, it may well be escalating. Will, will pressure mount, do you think, from the city and elsewhere to, to drop these things? Well, it depends on uh, inflation numbers and cost of living crisis, political fuss. You know, as long as inflation remains high, uh, you know, you can look at the sanctions and look at the war and say, you know, this is where it's coming from. It isn't necessarily, by the way, it's coming from all sorts of areas, but that's the, the obvious place. And so how long does the, the political unity remain to allow that cost of living crisis to just carry on? Do you think it might, if it does go on, sort of further fracture international cooperation? Uh, I think it might do. It's interesting what you said about the cost of living crisis. Let's, let's wait six months and that inflation going up and people can't heat their homes or buy their food or whatever it may be. And then if the, the cost of sanctions becoming clear to the UK public, it might be difficult to, no. to continue selling that. But you're Treasury right, it's, have to it's the autumn this. and winter time when this is going to get really, really in people's faces. There you are. Uh, hi, my name's Emma Cosmao and I'm an MA student at King's. Um, we've talked a lot about China and... Uh, changing away from the dollar. And I've been looking at Armenia a lot and their alignment with Russia and with Iran. And my question is, as they move towards the ruble, what does this mean for Iran? What does this mean for Armenia? That has quite a close relationship with the US. How is that going to change? Well, I, I mean, turning to Iran, Right. I mean, we know this is a separate uh, topic in itself. I mean, there are strong efforts at the moment to to reach an agreement uh, uh, with Iran, a, a, a revitalization of the JCPOA, and then there will be a re relaxation of sanctions um, uh, uh, against Iran, in the hope that th that relaxation and the sanctions will come with an ability to moderate uh, Iran's proliferation behaviour. Right um, now. Um, I, is that a good idea? Well, I, I don't well, I want, I want to go into that, but if, if sanctions are, are reduced on Iran, well, then there will, that will be one area where commodities may derive from and may help like, ameliorate some of the pressure that, 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 that is on us. Um, and I think that is some of the thinking behind this. But whether it's a good idea in itself, or that, that, is, a, that is a totally separate issue. But from, a, from an economic issue, yeah, I can see an agreement with Iran, whereby Iran is able to export um, its commodities to us. We'll, 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 we'll relax some of the pressure, certainly relax pressure on those developing countries that are really starting to suffer uh, from, from Russian from well, weren't you really talking about the converse, though? Yes. Yeah. 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 Exactly. I mean, I, th I think the Russians have a have a potential interest in you know, undermining the current uh, G JCPOA negotiations in order to form a little you know, yeah. ruble. Uh, family, along with the Armenia and possibly some others. I mean, this is this is the kind of counter mm. counter sanction, you know, which we must expect to happen. Do you see that happening, Mary? Sorry, you're outside my area here. Really, currencies? I thought that was it. Uh, well, you know, the details in here of uh, yeah. Armenia and. Uh, no, no, no. I just wondered whether whether a. You see the possibility of an emerging ruble group or something. Yes, like. I mean that's what I meant earlier when I said with the with the pullback of uh, globalisation and the pullback of the dollar over time, you are going to end up with much larger currency groups competing with each other, and uh, you know, this is symptomatic, possibly, possibly, of that beginning. Right, thank put you. Put pressure on Kazakhstan and Georgia. Yep, lady up there. Hi. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. Working. Yeah, carry on. Hi, Anna McDonald from Amati Global Investors. Um, I wondered what effect you felt that if we do decide to roll over on our sanctions when times get a little bit tough at the end of this year, what kind of precedent that sets when we look at Taiwan and China, and Taiwan still makes 80% of the world's semiconductor chips. Pauline, one for you. Well, I mean, I'm a bit deaf, well, well, What do you think the impact of mm. what is happening in Ukraine 
the sanctions and all the, is having is going to have on calculations about China and Taiwan on both oh, sides, I guess. Right, that's a sixty-four thousand dollar question. Was that uh, right? That, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, well, first of all, I think they'll watch very carefully. I don't think they'll do anything you know, for quite a bit until they have sized up, I suppose, how serious we are. I think we're probably turned out to be more serious in opposing Russia than they expected. And they will have taken notice of that. And they'll say, well, if they can do that there, a bit, a bit, perhaps you know, take the Americans a bit more seriously over Taiwan. Uh, they will look to see how the rest of the world reacts and whether we manage to alienate other people such that actually they do have a congregate of people in their corner. And I've no doubt that they will be you know, pushing out a message of a kind which increases their level of support. Um, and I think, I think that one is, is frankly all to play for. But I think they will, I, I think in fact they will, be, they will be careful because what they now know is that actually contrary to previous expectations, uh, the Western world can be quite serious and they'll, they'll wait to see whether we're actually willing to use force. I'd say one French uh, foreign policy expert yeah. and, and cynic said to me, if this goes bad to, bad, bad, badly for Russia and I was China, I wouldn't look at Taiwan, I'd look at Siberia. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, one of the, you asked right at the beginning, you know, why were we, why were we um, you know, engaging in sanctions? I think right at the beginning you said that. And I think you know, for an awful long time we've been engaging in sanctions because we wanted to, uh, to evade military action. I mean, it's a, it's a it's, you know, substitute policy for actually. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. Well, what, what do you think so about China? I, the, day, the day is going to come, I think, where we all. I, I'd be very surprised if we get away with what's happening in Ukraine without actually being faced with the question of whether we don't have to take military collective action. I agree that China has been watching what is happening with our sanctions very carefully. And they have been quite surprised by the unity of effort and the strength. But my own view in relation to China and Taiwan is that the main decision, the main point that will influence their decision will be a military one. Mm -hmm. Can they do it militarily and not? If they can do it militarily, then they will, have, they will deal with the sanctions as, as it comes. An, that's an open question, yeah. I think. Right. So, I mean, that's a separate issue, mm -hmm. right? But I don't think sanctions in themselves, no matter how effective against against the Russians will, will, will ultimately determine what course of action China uh, adopts against Taiwan. If they do anything, it's because they'll be confident that they can do it. And right. can, I, can I chip in on that? It's what I was talking about earlier with the whole ESG thing and the lack of consideration around G. Another area where the investment industry has been fairly lax in its analysis has been looking at the G around China. So, you know, there's been an awful lot of focusing on individual companies in China and individual areas of growth and an awful lot of looking at the fact that the companies that people are hoping to make large amounts of money from over the next decade or so are encased inside a system that doesn't necessarily fit either the S or the G that would suit the ordinary retail investor. They to mm. stop to think about it. And that's another thing that the industry has to sit down and have a really good think about over the next couple of right. years. This is going to be our last question uh, from the gentleman there. Uh, Josh Bernache, Royal Canadian Navy. Um, I'm just curious as this sort of this discussion trends towards talking about the long term goal of sanctions, which might be along the lines of containment, how do you, one, keep them effective over long term without secondary sanctions, uh, understanding the reason you wouldn't want to impose them, but they're not usually effective without them? And how do you avoid getting further into not just the cost of living crisis, but the wider supply chain crisis? We already talked about semiconductors as being sort of one of the next battlefields. Yeah, um, the things that go along with that globalization issue seems to be the next questions we have to solve strategically. And how do we start doing that? Right, question about yeah. secondary sanctions mm -hmm. driven by the Americans, particularly if this goes on. Well, you have to use secondary sanctions for the sanctions to continue to be effective, Martin. Yeah. Over time, sanctions, the power of sanctions will dissipate and the United States will no doubt try to impose secondary sanctions. I would say that against the EU and the UK, the US um, okay. tries uh, uh, secondary sanctions and we have blocking regulations, right? There are blocking regulations that prevent UK and EU companies from complying with American sanctions. Now, the truth is, right, the truth is that in many circumstances, you then find yourself between a rock and a hard place. You either comply with American sanctions or you comply with UK and US, or, or you comply with UK or EU sanctions. What to do? 
right? The unofficial answer is you comply with American sanctions because the, because the consequences of not doing so can be so huge in terms of financial penalties um, that many, many, many companies uh, ultimately end up complying with Americans. But there are various legal stratagems that you can do to, to avoid that dilemma. OK, I'm just going to ask you all finally for a final thought to end what has been an absolutely stimulating uh, panel. Jacob. Uh, I would say that the, the, the crisis in Ukraine has shown how important space is to all the military nations that are involved here. But also, I think it shows how important cooperation is internationally to, to get into Mars and the moon. And that is now starting to suffer. Mary. Um, the most important thing that comes out of this is the importance of uh, in the financial industry, the industry I watch, doing an awful less, well, not less in the way of uh, a box ticking and marketing, an awful lot more in the way of thinking very carefully about what is good and what isn't good for us as a whole. Very different things. Yeah, sometimes you often read uh, financial warfare, weapons of war, financial weapons of mass destruction. I saw financial shock and awe in the Financial Times. The most important thing to remember, financial war is not real war. Yeah, real war is boom, boom. Financial war is something completely different, often used as a panacea, as, 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 as a, thing for, a substitute for real action. Corey. Well, I would like to think, you know, we were, we were advancing. I think we're on a... Even if we win this war, my starting proposition, I think it's the, the future is going to be less good than it is at the moment. Um, it could go really bad. So I think we're going to have a very difficult beginning of the century. Well, on that cheering note, thank you very much <laughs> indeed uh, to my panel. Thank you. Thank you.